Tonight's Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 40. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, from verse 26. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two, or at the most three, should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace." As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anybody thinks he is a prophet, or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. This is the word of the Lord. As Kerry said to me, when we've been going through Corinthians, when we were recording one of the evening services, he says, Ian, you've got all the doozy passages. I said, yes, by design. But um, they, this is a, a notoriously, a notoriously difficult passage. So uh, you, just, you really do need to understand that. I want to go through it slowly. I want to go through it carefully. Um, and... <laughs> I've been trying to cut down the time of preaching, so if I go a little bit longer tonight, just be patient with me, be generous if you would. Um, I really do want to get, get through this and, and do it carefully. As I say, it is a notoriously difficult passage. Uh, there are a range of different uh, understandings of this passage. I've done copious amounts of reading. Uh, it's coming out of my ears. Um, so bear with me as we work our way through and try and get to some kind of synthesis as to what the Apostle Paul is saying uh, in this particular passage as it intersects with the rest of Scripture. So let's pray. Our Father, we recognize that you are a God of order, a God who is not a God who somehow chaotically works in ways that are contradictory to yourself, but there is a consistency to the way in which you work. While at times we confess that we read the Word and it seems as though some parts of Scripture are different to other parts and almost seem to contradict, we know that as we try and synthesize your Word, there is a way forward. And you are not a God of contradictions, but that you are a God of consistency. You don't change your mind. You don't say one thing and then say something completely different. So we pray that you, you would give us insight to understand how your word speaks to us in these somewhat difficult matters. Give us eyes to see, give us understanding, and we pray that we would leave here in some way edified, in some way having learnt, in some way better equipped to live out our Christianity in the world into which you have placed us. And we pray that through this process, you would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ for his sake. Amen. Amen. 
In Italy, a man went to a priest and confessed. Forgive me, Father, he said, sobbing. During World War II, I hid a refugee in my attic. Well, the priest replied, that's not a sin. But the man admitted, I made him pay rent. That wasn't very nice, the priest said, but you put yourself at risk. Oh, thank you, Father, the man said. But I have one more question. What is it, my son, the priest said. Do you think I have to tell him that the war is over? The end does not justify the means. One of the wrestles we have as churches, not just this church, every church across the ages, is the danger of wanting to say, let's operate in a way that fills up the church, but we're not really concerned with how we do that. So as long as we're getting people in and we're getting the crowds, the methodology or the, the way in which we do that is not really that important. And so we're willing at times, and I'm not saying this church, but I'm saying there have been churches willing at times to, to bend theological principles, to bend doctrine, because as long as the end result is what we get, then the means as to how we get there is unimportant. But this passage teaches us that it is important. God is concerned as to how we structure church. It's not just an organized chaos. It's not just do as we please. But God gives us His Word as a means by which we can be guided as to how we order our churches, how we do things. And there are ways in which God has given us that we need to adhere to. There are principles we need to apply. And at times, they may even be painful but they are principles that come out of the Word of God so that every church, regardless of whether they're charismatic or not charismatic, whether they're Baptist or Anglican, Presbyterian, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, needs to take the Word of God and needs to, for themselves, work out how those principles in God's Word apply and then consistently work them out in their worship services. Now, the Corinthian church was in a mess. You only have to read through the book to see that it's in a mess. There are all kinds of practices happening within that church that Paul has to address. And in fact, sometimes he has to be quite strong in his address and, and has to say to them, yes, you, you, you say that I'm unimpressive as a man, but don't, don't force me to come and have to do this in person. Uh, because if I have to, I will, and I'll come and, and sort you out if I need to sort you out. And in this particular area, they are in an absolute mess. There is chaos happening within their church services. Everyone is just doing their own thing. And so he's already dealt with that previously by saying, look, if you get unbelievers walking here and there's chaos happening, they're just going to get up and walk out. What have you accomplished in that? Now he deals with the problem of how that is playing itself out in terms of prophecy, in terms of tongues, and in terms of how tongues is being used uh, in the service with regard to the participation of women in the service. Now, no, there's some very controversial verses, verses here, and we'll get to them. But before we get to verses 33 to 35, which are the verses probably everyone's interested in getting to, we need to deal with the verses that lead up to those verses and ask ourselves, what are the principles that Paul is highlighting here that apply to us as the church? Well, I want you to notice firstly the importance of order. It's very, very important. He begins with tongues, the importance of order. Now, he, he does this in three different ways in terms of how order functions. The first is to do with tongues. Look at verses 27 and 28. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Principle one, all of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. So the underlying principle, which we looked at briefly last time, I'm not going to spend time on this, is that the use of whatever gifts the church has must always be for the strengthening of the body. Anything that does not strengthen the body doesn't have a place in the way in which 
it functions. If anyone speaks in a tongue, now he hones in. Two or three at the most should speak, one at a time, someone must interpret. Now the problem in the Corinthian situation is that tongues was something common in the ecstasy religions outside of the Christian religions. So if you went to a pagan temple, for example, and you participated in the worship of some pagan god, tongues was prominent. It happened there. And the way in which it happened was frenetic. Everyone just burst out and did their own thing in those services. Now, you've got to understand, if you're a Corinthian believer and you've come out of those religions and you've been participating in how it functions and now you're coming together as a church, there is some carryover, naturally. And so that carryover has been brought into the Christian church. And the way in which they functioned in those pagan settings is now being brought into the very church. And Paul is saying, whoa, just take, a, take your foot off the accelerator for a moment. That, that's not the way it's meant to function in a church. You may have done that in the pagan religions where everyone just goes mad and everyone just speaks at the same time and it's chaotic and it's frenzy going on. But that's not the way the church works. Why? Well, because God is a God of order. At the end of the day, it's not that God is somehow saying there should be no spontaneity. But even spontaneity needs to be done within the broader umbrella of order happening in the service. And so God says, I am a God of order, and therefore it needs to operate the way that is going to best show my character. And for tongues, that means two at the three at the most should speak one at a time, and then interpretation. Now that obviously makes some of the way in which tongues functions in some places unbiblical. Now I'm not trying to be nasty, I'm not trying to have a go at any church, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not. It's, it's, Satan does that very well. But the reality is if tongues is occurring in any given situation where more than one person is speaking in tongues... At the same time, Paul says, that's not the way it works. And then Paul says, three at the most should speak. And then one at a time, interpretation. Second, interpretation. Third, interpretation. It's pretty clear. I don't think anyone can really dispute what Paul says. And the goal of all of that is the edification. Otherwise, you're going to have chaos in the assembly. And so he says, if you really feel strongly that you want to speak in a tongue and uh, it's already been done, you need to speak quietly to yourself. It's between you and God. Don't speak it out loud. Many of us, or most of us, I suspect, engage in silent prayer, don't you? When you go home and you pray, most of you, I suspect, pray silently. When we come to a prayer meeting, I know there are people praying silently in that prayer meeting. Well, that's what Paul's saying. Don't, don't say it out loud. Whatever else you say, make sure tongues functions in a biblical way. And if it does, then it's fine for it to be practiced. Second, prophecy. Verses 29 to 33a. Two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophet are subject to the control of the prophets, because God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Same principle. If there are prophets in the congregation, Paul says one at a time. And if it so happens, because you remember Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 says the foundation of the church is built on the apostles and the prophets. 
So that as Paul is speaking about profiture, he's speaking about the fact that the, the New Testament hasn't come into, into being quite yet, and so God is still speaking through prophets. And in that sense, if God brings a revelation to bear on a particular prophet in the congregation, and there is a prophet speaking at the moment, and this revelation comes heavily upon, I don't know how the person would know that God is, is bringing a revelation to bear since they had the gift of prophecy. I guess they had worked out how that functioned in their life. Then the other prophet who's standing up and speaking must sit down, let the one whom God is giving a revelation stand up and speak that revelation in the congregation. But it's always one at a time. There's never two, three, four people speaking at the same time. Then those prophecies are weighed because naturally, if we're going to have a prophecy and this is coming from God and a revelation from Him, then we need to know that the revelation is actually from God. And so the, the, the spirit of the prophets is then subject to evaluation of those who are gifted in prophecy that they may weigh those prophecies and make sure that those prophecies conform to Scripture. Well, what Scripture? Well, obviously at that point they have the Old Testament. And so it must conform to that which has been given to God's people in terms of the principles that come out. The New Testament is yet to be formed. It is in process and so those who are gifted then help discern whether those prophecies are right or wrong. Are you all with me so far? Okay, now we get to the hard verses. Verses 33b to 36. As in all the congregation of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something they should ask there, and that should really be translated menfolk. I think husbands is not a great translation. The word that is used there can be translated husbands, but it can also be translated more generally. And I think in the context, because words are translated in their broader context, menfolk would be a better translation. So they should ask their menfolk at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. What on earth is the apostle saying there? Now there are at least eight different views on this particular passage. Now I want to give you just a couple just to highlight the fact that this is a very difficult passage to translate or to understand. There are some who say, that Paul is making a blanket statement that says in churches, women are to remain absolutely silent. They can't pray, they can't stand up and share a testimony, they can't sing from the front, they can't do anything. They just walk through the doors, and as they walk through the doors, their mouths are shut, and they've got to keep quiet for the rest of the service. Now there are some churches that today still practice that. However, in the context in which Paul is saying, I don't think that's what Paul is saying. Because you have to reconcile that with chapter 11, verse 5, where Paul has said, well, women can pray. So if women can pray, how is it that now suddenly women can't pray in a congregational setting? So I'm not sure that that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Others say, well, what the Apostle Paul is in fact saying here is that this only applies to wives. So if you've, if you've got married, now suddenly you can't participate in the service in these ways and you've got to keep quiet. And, and, and if your husband stands up and says something and you want to say something, you can't say anything. And so just go home and I'll tell you and ask your husband what the, what the situation is. But if that's the case, that is religious jingoism at its worst, religious chauvinism. In other words, when you get married, your status drops. Because if you're not married, you can speak, but now that you're married, you can't. And now you've got to be silent. I don't think Paul's saying that either. Some reduce it simply to a cultural context. So they say, well, Paul was a bit of a chauvinist, actually, and, and you see what, what's going on here is, is Paul is exercising a, a measure of chauvinism, uh, and, and, and Paul is simply 
speaking into the context of the Corinthian church, and it only applies to the Corinthian church, and so we can reduce it simply to the current situation, but it doesn't apply more broadly than that. The problem with that, of course, is Paul says, for all the churches, and then at the end he says this applies to all the churches, and he talks about going back to the law. As we will see, the law here is something very specific in mind that the Apostle Paul says. So I don't think you can do that, because if you reduce it to a cultural context, well, we can do the same with homosexuality. And so we can say, Paul, when he speaks to the Romans about homosexuality, well, it only applies to the Roman church, and so it doesn't actually apply more broadly than that. But Paul talks about all the churches, and he says we have no other command, but this is the command from the Lord. And so I don't think you can reduce it to a cultural situation. Others claim that you've got some uneducated women in the congregation who are being noisy in the congregation and shouting out. Goodness me, what chauvinism is that? There were some highly educated people, a woman in Paul's day. So simply to reduce women to uneducated shouting out in a church service, I think is an extreme form of chauvinism. And he's not saying that either. There are only really two possibilities, I think, that come out of this, that work. The one is that it may be that Paul is speaking about specifically the evaluation of prophecy. So, for example, Don Carson will will argue that that it it comes to the evaluation of prophecy that uh, Paul is speaking about in the context of this uh, broader Uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians 14, so that when it comes to the evaluation of prophecy, because there is a measure of authority that is is used in the evaluation of prophecies, women are excluded from that. Now, it is possible that that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. I wouldn't want to rule that out entirely, but I think there's a better way of understanding these verses that is more consistent with this passage in 1 Corinthians 14 The passage we looked at in 1 Corinthians 11, particularly verse 5, and in view of what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 to 13, because you've got to hold all of those in tension. What is it? Well, I think that what Paul is speaking about is that there is a link here between chapter 11 and chapter 14 In fact, there are a number of links in terms of what's going on in the broader spectrum of this Corinthian church. And the link is between prayer, prophecy, and tongues. So you have Paul speaking about that in chapter 11, and then you have him raising it again in chapter 14. The context of chapter 11 is Paul links those three things to what occurs in a private setting, and he deals with verse 5 as the application of what occurs in a private setting. Now Paul is bringing it into the public arena where he's dealing with how prayer, prophecy, and tongues functions when a church meets together. You remember, he says three times after chapter 11, when you come together, when you meet together, when you assemble together. So the context now has changed, whereas Paul's dealt with that, how it deals with it in a private setting, he now deals with it in a public setting. And it's the only link that we have that occurs between prayer, prophecy, and tongues in all of Scripture. Other links in chapter 14 and chapter 11 is that he says what applies in chapter 11 applies to all the churches. He says the same thing in chapter 14. This applies to all the churches. There is one more link in there. And that is that the final link is, he says in chapter 14, verse 35, to do anything different is shameful. And in chapter 11, verse 6, he says it's disgraceful, which is the same Greek word that is used. So I think there are definite links between prayer, tongues, and prophecy in chapter 11, and then again in chapter 14. In both chapters, Paul is making the same basic point, that God has created the way in which we function, and particularly as we come together as a church, in terms of the different roles that God has given. In 1 Corinthians 11, he looks at that in a more broad spectrum, that he goes back to creation, and he establishes the principle based on the creation principle, 
of man having been created first. This is not simply a order of chronological order, but first in terms of priority. And he works that out in chapter 11, how that looks in a private setting. And then he returns to chapter 14 and he says, let's look and see how that now occurs in a public setting. Thus, in the light of these links, I think that the praying and the silence that is spoken about is the praying in tongues that Paul is referencing. That fits into the broader context of chapter 14. After all, he does in the very next verses speak again about prophesying and tongues. So that that would then make sense of how you synthesize chapter 11 and chapter 14 and 1 Timothy 2, 11, 12. In other words, in the area where some kind of verbal revelatory speech is given, whether that come through prophecy, whether that come through tongues, whether that come through the preaching of God's word, all of those have a certain level of authority attached to them. And in that sense, it is confined biblically to male leadership. So when we try and tease this out a little, where in Scripture do we see this principle playing itself out? Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about women speaking in tongues anywhere else, only here. But it does say a lot about prophecy. And so we can draw some inferences from how prophecy functions in Scripture in relation to women prophesying. Now, there are ten occurrences of prophetesses in Scripture. Three false. So the false one involves Naodiah, who uh, tries to intimidate Ezekiel by bringing a prophecy. And then you have a, another one of a prophetess in um, Revelation, Jezebel, remember? We, Revelation talks about Jezebel being a false prophet. Um, and then you have another one in Ezekiel who pronounces judgment on those daughters who are prophesying falsely. So those are the false prophecies. We can take them out of the picture. We want to look at the seven instances of where we see prophetesses functioning within Scripture. And that's what I want to just look in a little bit of detail so we can understand this a little bit better. In the New Testament, Anna is a pro uh, was spoken about a prophecy of Anna in Luke uh, chapter tw 2, verses 36 to 38. You know the prophecy she brings. You have then prophecy spoken of in a general sense, prophetesses in Luke 2, 17, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And then you have it again in uh, Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, where Philip's four daughters are spoken of as prophetesses. Now, with all of those, those three that I've mentioned, none of them tell us how they are prophesying. They simply say they bring prophecies, but we aren't told how that occurs. We do have some instances where we are told how that occurs. In the Old Testament, Isaiah's wife prophesied in 8 verse 3, but also it doesn't tell us how. But there are some very useful ones, and I want to go through those. Miriam, Moses' sister, prophesied a hymn of praise to the Lord. Let me read it to you. Exodus 15 verse 20. Then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her with the tambourine dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider has hurled into the sea. So when we look at Miriam's prophecy and the way in which it was exercised and the context in which it is exercised, it is exercised there primarily only, in fact, towards women. Then you get a second one of um, uh, Hilkiah the priest of Akram, Akabor, went to speak to the prophetess Hilda. So this is Hilda now. We find this in uh, 2 Kings 22. The wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, the son, oh, these names are hard, the son of Hahas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in the Jerusalem in the second district. She said to him, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. 
Tell the man who, who sent you to me, this is what Yahweh says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book of the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me to anger by all the idols that their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of Yahweh, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before Yahweh when you heard the, what I had spoken against this place and his people, they would become a curse and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I've heard you, declared Yahweh. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I am going to bring to this place. So they took her answer back to the king. Now when you hear that prophecy coming from Hilda, where is it happening and to whom is it being brought? It happens in a private context, not in the public assembly, not in the temple, in a private context, not in, to all the people of Israel, to a man who's been sent to hear from her. So there's no doubt that she prophesies, but she prophesies in a private context. There's one more. Deborah, Judges 4.4. 4. Deborah, a prophetess of the wife of Lapidot, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinam from Kadesh, in Naphtali, and said to him, Yahweh, the God of Israel, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and leave the way to Mount Tabor. Now, Judges is the book where chaos reigns. And so what was happening there is these men would come to Deborah in a private setting, in a private context, and she would bring a prophecy to them. So all we can say from Scripture is that where we are told how it occurs, in the instances that we are told, prophecy occurs in a private setting, not in a public setting. And Paul has dealt with that in 1 Corinthians 11, where he says in the context of the home, in the context of private, these things occur and are able to occur. But now he takes it into a public setting, now the setting is different because it is the church coming together. And Paul says in this public setting where tongues is being exercised by way of a revelation coming through the tongues and where prophecy is being exercised where there's a revelation coming through God to the people, women should remain silent in that context. I think the context determines that. And I think the context makes that clear. In verse 26 to 40, he's trying to correct a number of abuses that are occurring within the church. And he is trying to say to them, when it comes to the way in which these two gifts are exercised in this context, because of the revelatory nature and because of the authority that comes with that revelatory nature, those gifts in that context are confined to the male leadership that God has put in place. Now he refers to the law. Listen to what he says. As in all the congregation of the saints, women should remain silent in the church. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. Now what he means by that, because you might ask the question, well, what is the law that Paul is referring to here? Because Paul doesn't give us explicitly what the law is. And the answer, of course, comes in chapter 11. Paul has already given us which passage he is dealing with in chapter 11. And the law that he goes back to, that Paul always goes back to, and this is verified again in 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through to 13, is the creation order. Paul takes us back to Genesis 2, verses 20 to 24, where God establishes a creation order. In other words, Paul never argues from a cultural context. He never says, this is, this is what the culture says, and therefore we must bow down to the culture. Paul always takes it back to how God has ordered society, always takes it back to the creation context. So if I can quote one of the commentators. 
by the term law. Paul means the law of Moses, and specifically Genesis 2. Two chapters earlier, Paul cited in Genesis 2 to support his teaching on women and men's roles. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for woman's sake, but woman for the sake of the man. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9. Paul doesn't need to repeat the same Genesis verses from 1 Corinthians 14. He already has, so he simply abbreviates them by saying, the law also says. Please observe that Paul never tires of telling his readers that his gender teachings are rooted soundly in the creation laws of Genesis. And then he simply says, if there is any confusion about that, the woman should ask their menfolk, whether it's a wife, her husband. If it's a single woman, speak to one of the elders in the privacy or speak to someone else, uh, the spiritual leaders of the church in the privacy of uh, outside of the church service. So I think, if I've understood this correctly, I think the prohibition here is not a universal prohibition. It is a prohibition specifically confined to praying in tongues and prophesying within the church because of the authority of those particular gifts exercised. In the context preceding and the context succeeding, Paul is saying women need to remain silent in those two areas. So that means applicationally that a woman can sing in a church Women can pray in a church. Women can read scripture in a church. Women can share a testimony in the church, as is currently occurring in this church. But Paul then restricts the participation of women in those two areas because of the authoritative nature of those particular gifts and how they were functioning and how they function in the church. I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you. This is not a general admonition for women to keep silent in the church in every way. It is, really has to deal with what Paul has already said, that we are functionally different, intrinsically equal. So it's not the issue of equality that Paul is ever bringing into question. We are equal before God. There is no difference. But the way in which we function, the roles that God has given are qualitatively different. And those roles are based on how God has created us, which goes right back to the beginning in the creation, Genesis chapter 2. So when you read that, please don't see this as simply saying to women, you can't participate, you can't say anything in a service, not saying that. And so we would continue to want to encourage women in the church to participate in our services, in testimonies, in congregational praying, in singing, in sharing, in scripture reading, and so on and so forth. And then finally, he says the importance of obedience. Look at verses 37 to 40. If anybody thinks he is a prophet, let's pick it up from verse 36. Did the word of God originate with you, or are you only people it has reached? In other words, are you the only ones who think you've got a a, a understanding of the word of God? If anybody thinks he's a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is is, is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Do you hear what Paul's saying? He's saying, if you really think I'm talking rubbish here, just understand this is not Paul speaking. This is a command from the Lord. So either you obeyed as from God, or you don't obey it. And if you don't obey it as coming from God, well, then you're in disobedience to God. That's what he says, not what I'm saying. That's what he says. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Paul is simply saying... If you disobey the teaching on these matters, you are ultimately rebelling against the Lord. 
And so that's on your head. And he ends by saying we need to continue to operate in a way that is fitting in the sight of God. Now I know, I know, this is not popular today. I know that it's very easy at this point to simply bow down to the pressure that is exercised by some who say, no, 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 uh, God has given roles of spiritual leadership and eldership and pastoring to women. But that's not what the Word says. And so either we, we submit to the Scriptures or we don't. And as difficult as it might be in our day and age, it's only become difficult in the last 50-odd years. Before that, it wasn't an issue. 1900s of years, it wasn't an issue. And the, ultimately, we have to say, are we going to allow God's Word to direct us? Or are we going to allow our own opinions to direct us? Which is more important? command from the Lord or what we think we should or shouldn't do in the way in which we operate as a church this is not a put down of women this is not in any sense saying they're inferior not in any sense this is not bringing to question the equality of men and women it's not saying the status of men is more than the status of women it's simply saying that God has created us to function in a way that is different. Different is neither good nor bad. It's just different. And so we simply submit to the Lord and trust that he knows more than we know. And we do so joyfully and willingly. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. We pray that you would help it to be burnt upon our hearts. We pray that you would help us to follow it, to submit to it, and to do so with great joy and enthusiasm, because it's your word. And we pray that as we follow you, and as we seek to order ourselves according to what you have revealed in your word, that you would strengthen us, and that you would help us to be faithful to you and to what you have declared. For Jesus' sake, amen.